Welcome everyone to the sixth of the Sunday Conversations with MassME. This program is co-presented by the Massachusetts MECFS and FM Association and the New Jersey MECFS Association. This presentation is titled, A Whole Person Health Approach to Myalgic Encephalomyelitis Chronic Fatigue Syndrome, Lessons for Post-COVID Conditions. My name is Ken Friedman. I am the father of a person with ME, and I am pleased to be back as host for a Sunday conversation as of today. I have had an active academic interest in ME since the mid 1990s and have been active in MECFS for both the New Jersey MECFS Association and the Vermont MECFS Association for many years. There is a slide that um, we can put up that will show you my uh, other credentials. And you'll be able to see that more formally or take your leisure looking at it uh, when the recording is made available to you. Today, our featured speaker is Dr. Maria Vera Nunez, more popularly known as Dr. Vera. Dr. Vera is a board certified internal medicine and integrative medicine physician. She is also a certified functional medicine practitioner and has a master's degree in medical informatics. She was an assistant professor at Nova Southeastern University's Institute for Neuroimmune Medicine, which as many of you know, is a national referral center for MECFS cases. She was there for seven years. Currently, she is an attending physician at the Whole Psychiatry and Brain Recovery Center in Maryland and a research assistant professor at the Medical University of South Carolina. After Dr. Vera's presentation, we will also hear from Kylie, a person with MECFS. So now we will go to our formal presentation of Dr. Vera. Dr. Vera, I yield the floor to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Friedman, uh, for that lovely presentation. Uh, also, thank you to the organizers of this meeting for inviting me to speak about this topic. And thank you to all the attendees that are uh, seeing this webinar today. I want to start with the explanation of what is the concept of whole person health. Uh, this is a definition used by the National Institute of Health here in the United States uh, for an approach where when you are evaluating a patient, you look at the person as a whole. You will evaluate the clinical symptoms, but also you want to see what other factors affect their health. So you're going to look into the mental health uh, on the environment, physical, social. And what we want is change the shift of the focus from disease to restore and promote health and also to prevent disease. Whole health, uh, it's also another uh, term used by the Department of Veteran Affairs where we are putting the patient at the center and we look into what is important for the patient, what goals does the patient have for the care. So you can see here, it starts with the patient and what the patient can do to improve the, their own health. And then you can add uh, the support of professional care in different aspects that involve not only the, the symptoms they have, but also where they live, uh, the mental health component, how do they deal with the stress, nutrition, and also how you can create a community that can support these patients so you can address all these concerns. So why is it important to apply this whole person approach to the care of ME-CFS? 
We know that MECFS is a complex condition that affects multiple systems in the, in the body. The usual approach in the standard of care in medicine is when a patient has a symptom, we usually will look what symptoms, uh, what systems are being affected, and then they will be referred by a specialist. And where they will, if they have stomach issues, will go to a gastroenterologist or a cardiologist or a pulmonologist, depending on the area where they're having symptoms. What we know is that with MECFS, patients will have symptoms in multiple systems at the same time. So when we try to use this same approach, uh, we will have a comparison of this image we have here of the story of the blind men that were trying to describe how an elephant looked like. They will just go to the part that they can touch and then they will say, you know, this is just, uh, if they will touch the leg, they will say it's a tree or if they touch the trunk, they will say it's a snake. And they won't have a whole idea of, of what the problem is. So there's something similar that happens with MECFS when we try to just focus in one area. Our patients will get different diagnoses. And what we want to do is being able to take a step back and see if we can find a common uh, cause or a common um, mechanism that is affecting the patient that will uh, help to address the symptoms. So this is where integrative medicine comes in. Integrative medicine is also what is considered a whole person health approach because it will focus on the patient and the patient's needs and preferences. And depending on that, based on that, then we can use different kinds of interventions. The patient may need medications or may even need surgery, but also there could be some mind-body interventions, nutritional interventions, or some botanicals, herbs that can help that the idea is that we can find treatments that have evidence that can help the patient in a way that the patient feels comfortable and is able to move forward with the care. Another important factor is that when we are talking about the care of patients with MECFS, we have to think about a team effort. It's very important to create a partnership because when you have a, a provider who can help, they may not have all the answers, but if they are open to get the information that the patient gives them, or they are open to read and research a little more, it's very helpful to have that connection. And at the same time, it's important to empower the patient and in some cases, the caregivers of patients with MECFS because you are the expert in your own body. You know what symptoms you have and what kind of reactions you may have to certain treatments, what kind of responses. So it's important that, that both parts are working together and that way you can advance in your care. Sometimes a clinician may not be enough to be able to cover all the needs that a patient has. And that's why the integrative medicine approach uses a team effort. You will have a provider that could be an allopathic doctor, osteopathic doctor, a naturopathic doctor, a nurse practitioner. And in the team, you may need to have support from other healthcare specialties to support the needs of the patient, like working with a nutritionist or a physical therapist, occupational therapist or exercise physiologist. Uh, maybe sometimes you may need to have support with a psychologist, uh, some other specialists that do manual therapies like massage therapy or acupuncture. And right now there's a lot of information about uh, using health coaches as well, because they may help the patient to do the uh, specific parts on how to do the recommendations, implement recommendations in real life when they are at home in their own environment. So we need to think about decentralizing the power. It's not just the clinician, the provider, and the patient. It's like we are all together moving towards one direction. Now, what is functional medicine? When we are talking about integrative medicine, as we said, there are different modalities that we can offer to the patients depending on their uh, condition and depending on their preferences. Functional medicine is a modality inside integrative medicine. And the whole idea with functional medicine, the approach is that we are looking to find an underlying mechanism. When we have a patient who has a diagnosis of MECFS, 
we usually won't have uh, two, pa two patients with the same diagnosis won't have the same symptoms, the same environment, the same uh, story. So what is important when we are looking about talking about evaluating a patient with MECFS is we do a little more investigation in functional medicine to try to identify what factors can be contributing or causing problems. So for example, uh, we talk about their maybe the genetic um, story, like family history, the predisposition to certain conditions or exposure in the environment from before. When we talk about triggers, we are looking at uh, different factors that may have the cause the development of MECFS. Some cases patients may have uh, started having symptoms after an infection. Some patients may have uh, started symptoms after a traumatic event or a very uh, traumatic surgery. So it could be different triggers for different patients. And also there are other factors that are called mediators. That is what is happening right now that is still maintaining a per the patient uh, in a cycle of disease. So as you can see in this graphic, it's important when we're talking about these different systems levels, a same patient that has a diagnosis of MECFS may have different uh, sub-diagnosis, uh, may have issues with uh, different systems as well that they are all connected. And the whole idea with functional medicine is go a little deeper so you can find what common factors could be affecting this network and create a personalized plan for the patient. That's why it may not be you may have had experience that some supplements or medications are helpful for one person, but may not have the same effect in other person. So that's the idea of evaluating and making it a customized plan for every patient. Now, what are some of the lessons that we can use that we have learned in the care of MECFS that may apply to patients who have post-COVID conditions? We don't know the exact uh, frequency prevalence of uh, post-COVID conditions in the United States and in the world, but what we know is that there is there are a group of patients who are presenting symptoms that are similar to MECFS after they had an infection with COVID-19, could be weeks or months, and they, uh, they don't recover and continue having fatigue and some other symptoms as well. So the explanation today is we're going to talk about some uh, management and evaluation uh, techniques that we, we use in, in MECFS that can be helpful for patients who are now having symptoms of COVID or after having COVID infection. The first part, what is very important, and if I want for you to get, take a home message would be this, is that you need to start with a foundation that has to do with your lifestyle. We may have a lot of uh, information and research development on having new medications, new interventions, but if you don't focus on these factors of things that you do every day in your life, you may not have the same benefit or any benefit at all from some of these other interventions. So it's essential that when you are thinking about how you can help your health, you start focusing on things you do and everyday life because you have some control over those. So those factors are your nutrition, your diet, how you manage your stress, uh, your sleep, the activity exercise that you're able to do, and also the relationships and connections uh, that you have in your life. So when we talk about nutrition, we know that patients who have MECFS are at risk of having uh, the nutrient deficiencies. There are many factors for this. Some of them are the long-term use of medications. So you will have certain medications that cause the decrease in levels in certain nutrients, or you may use more of those nutrients and your needs increase. Also, many patients with MECFS have uh, gastrointestinal problems. They may have an imbalance in the kind of bacteria they have in their gut that triggers some inflammation and affects how you can absorb the nutrients. Uh, there's also uh, what's called the small intestinal bacterial overgrowth that also can affect how you absorb nutrients in your gut. This autonomia is another factor. This is a problem in the autonomic nervous system that can cause issues uh, of motility. Maybe patients may have a lot of nausea or reflux or gastroparesis when you feel that your digestion takes longer and takes many hours for you to digest a food. 
Sometimes also uh, that can be an abnormal release of digestive enzymes that help you break down food. That also can affect how you absorb those nutrients. There are also description of other problems that can affect uh, the abs absorption of nutrients. Uh, many patients with MECFS may have dental issues with dry mouth and not enough saliva or have some uh, inflammation in the gums or difficulties uh, chewing. Uh, also, there's a description of uh, presence of eating disorders. And in more severe cases, some patients may need to use a tube feed. So there has been description of many multiple uh, nutrient deficiencies in patients who have MECFS. And that's also another area where it's important to discuss with your clinical provider to check your levels because every person is different. And sometimes you may need um, to receive a higher dose to be able to get to a normal level. And you need those that information to adjust the dose of the nutrient replacement and also to identify if you need nutrient replacement. There are different uh, ways to do this uh, from regular labs that you can get through your insurance for something, some vitamins and nutrients to more comprehensive testing where they will evaluate many other nutrients. So even if you can start with something simple, some nutrients that are usually low or affected in patients with chronic fatigue, MECFS, are vitamin D, vitamin B12, folate, iron, and omega-3s. All of those are available with regular uh, laboratories under insurance care. The second aspect we were talking about is the uh, management of stress. We are submitted to stress in multiple uh, facets in our life. We just came out from a pandemic that also made uh, cause a lot of changes in our lifestyle, in our life uh, uh, reality. So we are that. One thing is for certain is that the stress is a constant. And as you can see in this graphic, the effect of having a stress for a long time, and sometimes just the fact that you are sick that also can be a source of stress, that can affect many systems in our, in our body and have uh, consequences in the long term. So it can affect your brain, can affect your uh, heart and blood vessels, your digestion, your adrenal glands, respiratory system. So it's important that we have some kind of mechanism on how to cope with the stress, how to deal with the stress. Many times patients who have MECFS also have less tolerance, less resilience when there's a stressful situation. So the idea here is that whatever is your preference, you find something that you can apply and practice every day. And that way you can start training your body and your system to respond to stress better. One simple uh, way to do uh, to help is uh, the use of diaphragmatic or belly breathing. As you can see in this graphic, when we breathe normally, when we inhale, we our chest rises, and um, when we exhale, our chest goes down. The purpose of belly breathing is gonna be the opposite. When you breathe in, your belly goes out, and you, when you breathe out, your belly goes in. The way this works is that you have this between the chest cavity and your belly, there's this muscle called the diaphragm. And right below the diaphragm, the, the vagus nerve runs. And when you do this different breathing pattern, you are stimulating your vagus nerve. And that is helping to go into repair balance mode in your body. You can repeat this as frequently as you, as you want, uh, especially when you are having a stressful situations. If you can stop for a, a few seconds, remember and start doing that, changing the breathing pattern that's going to help uh, to, to de deal with the stress better. The more you do it, the more powerful intervention would be. Um, at the end of this uh, talk, uh, the organizers are gonna uh, help me um, pop, so you can receive some of the resources that include some um, links on how you can, uh, more information about belly breathing and how you can practice with videos and recommendations. There are other interventions as well. And as I said, it depends on your preference. Some people may be able to do some Tai Chi or yoga. 
Uh, some may have uh, the ability to do mindfulness practices like meditation. And some people may need some extra support from a therapist to be able to do some other interventions like cognitive behavioral therapy or guided imagery by a feedback. And one very uh, important factor that is also coming up in the research uh, literature is gratitude practices. This uh, could be as simple as just starting your day, writing down in a notebook, in a diary, three things you are grateful for, but that kind of changes the uh, response in your body and your kind of perspective for the whole day can make a difference as well on how you handle stress. The third factor that is important and foundational is your sleep. We know that, that many patients with MECFS uh, have issues feeling restored when they sleep, and they may wake up, may have insomnia, may have uh, issues uh, that affect their sleep quality. One reason why sleep is so important that is also coming up, there's more uh, research happening right now, is about the glymphatic system. The glymphatic system, as you can see in this graphic, this represents the brain tissue, these are the meningi, and this is the skull. This red uh, uh, vessel brings the spinal, cerebrospinal fluid, and that cerebrospinal fluid moves through the brain tissue to clear all the waste products that happens that we produce from normal functioning during the day. And that flow will go to the lymphatic vessels to release all these waste uh, in the brain. So that is the glymphatic system that they are describing and they're starting to research more. And what is important about this is that if you have issues with chronic inflammation in the brain, this will be affected and you don't get to release all the waste products they start accumulating and then they cause some of the symptoms related to fatigue, brain fog that some patients describe to me like having cotton balls in the middle of your ears. It's related to this waste accumulation. When you sleep, uh, when you go into deep sleep is when this happens. Most of this activity happens in your deep sleep. So if you are the sleep deprived, you are gonna have less release of these waste products in the brain and that can cause consequences in the long term. So some recommendations to help with sleep from the whole medicine, integrative medicine approach is to have as much as possible scheduled time when you go to sleep and when you wake up. You can avoid uh, drinking coffee or other stimulants before going to bed or having some anxiety inducing activities close to bedtime, like watching the news or reading an upsetting email that will affect your sleep as well. Another factor is the blue screen that comes from this uh, screen, uh, the blue light that comes uh, from the screens in all the devices like laptops and TVs and smartphones will block the production of melatonin. Melatonin is the chemical in your brain that tells your brain it's time to go to sleep. So when you, the more you're exposed during the late afternoon hours to this light, you are blocking that your own production of melatonin and that will affect your sleep time, bedtime. So uh, you can use, ideally it would be that you, an hour or so before bedtime, you don't have any contact with any of these devices, but being realistic, the other option is to use something that blocks that blue light and won't affect your melatonin production. So you, there's many apps available for the phones and the tablets and the computers. And also there are some glasses that can block the blue light as well that can help to reset your cycle. Also uh, having a dark bedroom that has a comfortable temperature. And you can also, the belly breathing technique we described a few minutes ago, you can use that when you go to bed before going to sleep, will help you transition into sleep more easily. This is also important if you snore, you uh, should discuss, or somebody tells you that you snore, you should discuss with your clinician about having uh, your uh, home oxygen uh, levels tested at home. And uh, usually this has to do with insurance coverage. They may not uh, cover a full sleep test from the beginning, but this home oximetry is a possibility. You kind of just have the oxygen monitor. And the, if you have decreases in your oxygen levels at night, that will help your, your clinician to discuss and get the insurance approved uh, 
for a sleep study to evaluate for sleep apnea. Now, the fourth component has to do with uh, the amount of activity or exercise that you can do. Uh, we know that with patients with MECFS, uh, activity and exercise can trigger a relapse of the symptoms. And we are also finding that patients with post-COVID conditions are describing the same problem as well. The idea here is that the energy production uh, may be affected by issues with your mitochondrial function, the part of your cell that produces energy. And when you have less energy coins for the day, if you use your energy early during the day, then you won't have energy left for the afternoon. And that's when sometimes people describe having a crash period by the end of the day. Now, while we are working on other factors to help and understand why you're having this issue, one uh, uh, strategy to help is energy conservation, also called pacing. And the idea here is that if you are able to keep track of your activities and see how many hours you are able of activity you are able to have during the day, then you may be able to do a little less than that um, limit that you have for the day that will allow to avoid those crash episodes. Every time you have a crash episode when you are push yourself and you did too much, all that energy will go to help with inflammation and some other uh, processes that happen in your body. And you don't have really much energy left to heal and repair and balance your body. Um, this uh, guide that is from Paul, uh, the World's Physiotherapy website, and you have the information here, uh, has a lot of resources on pacing and some strategies on how you can help maybe prioritize your activities, and one of the options is also to wear an activity tracker that will help uh, to either uh, use your number of steps per day or your heart rate. Even now, uh, there are some devices that measure your heart rate variability with also a measurement. Uh, the more, um, the higher your heart rate variability, the better. So those days when your heart rate variability is low, those are days that you can take it a little easier and rest more. One more thing that also I found that could be helpful for patients who have MECFS or have issues with energies, thinking about um, they may not have as much energy to organize and keep everything clean and keep up to date with the house chores, but the cluttering, getting rid of things you don't need, and uh, some of this may benefit from the minimalist, minimalistic approach, uh, then it will be easier to maintain things uh, so you can you don't feel overwhelmed. Uh, I'm also providing some resources about some um, areas where you can find more information about pacing or energy conservation, as well as, as these other activities for organization. The last one of these five elements in the foundation is the importance of having close relationships and connection. I would say the first close relationship you need to have is with yourself. Realize and accept and love the person you are right now. Because there's a lot of uh, changes that may have happened since you got sick and also a grief, grief process after things that, that evaluating things that you may have lost or you are not able to do anymore. So that's the first part to be able to look in the mirror and say, I love you to yourself. And then also be able and look for close relationship. Could be either in person or remotely, but having somebody that you can connect with and uh, some organizations like the ones organizing this event are helpful as well. That can help you find people who are going through similar uh, conditions as yourself, because there's research showing that when you have these close connections and it doesn't have to be a lot of people, could be one or two or three people, there's a decreased risk in heart disease and stroke. Also, uh, the studies show that there's this lower risk of depression and dementia. Also, if you don't have the option to find human companionship, pets are also helpful. They are also some studies showing how they can help with uh, this um, uh, management of the health. Um, also, there's more information about now how your connection with nature can make a difference. Uh, Dr. Susan Simard has published a book called Finding the Mother Tree, 
And also she has a talk, uh, a TED talk available in YouTube where uh, she describes the research she has done, finding how trees in a forest connect to each other through mycelial, like little um, or organisms through the uh, root system and how they help each other and send all these nutrients when they are in stress or when there's not enough food or sunlight and all connected to a main tree that's called the mother tree. And the idea here is that all that connection can also help you uh, find balance and, and uh, find motivation to uh, find balance in your, in your life. Um, recently, I saw a documentary that was describing the experience of a nonprofit group that takes patients who survive cancer through a mountain, a trek through the mountains for a week. And the Im impact and power it had of being able to connect not only with other people, but with nature itself, how it helps with the healing and balance. I understand that may, uh, some of you may have limitations. You may not be able to go a whole week to camp in a trek, but uh, sometimes it could be just uh, some, something simple as going to the park, sitting next to a tree. If you cannot do that, sometimes just opening the window and watching trees and, uh, and nature outside, and sometimes even just connect with a plant. You can have a small plant in your home or your apartment. That connection, finding some, some uh, relationship to something bigger than yourself can also make a difference. Some people may also have some spiritual practices as well, so that also is part of the healing. And the whole idea for all these foundation elements is that if you can implement simple in a simple way all of these, as consistently as you can, that's a strong foundation for what, what any other intervention or treatment that you're going to receive. So there are a couple of more aspects that I think are uh, relevant to share that uh, things that we have learned in MECFS that can be helpful for COVID, uh, patients who have COVID-19 um, illnesses or, or con post COVID-19 conditions. Muscle activation is a uh, a problem where mast cells are cells in the immune system that normally uh, will be part of an allergic response. So when you have a, a urticaria or anaphylaxis reaction, mast cells are responsible. They have histamine and many other chemicals, but we are finding that with MECFS, there's an increase in the mast cell uh, number. And also, not only that, but they may be more unstable and they may release chemicals with other triggers, not just an allergy. The issue with mast cell activation syndrome is that it may present with many symptoms in the body. As you can see here, it could be starting from regular skin rashes or hives, but also could be associated with lightheadedness or passing out, having pain, stomach issues, nausea, diarrhea, brain fog. So it can affect many aspects in the body. What is interesting is that the research is showing that uh, patients who have post-COVID conditions, this hyperinflammation cytokine storm response that happened in some patients, especially who had severe symptoms, could be associated to this abnormal response in mast cells. And there's also some published uh, cases where they are finding that medications that help to stabilize mast cells or block the mediators they release, the chemicals they release, can be helpful with symptoms with COVID, post COVID-19 illness. So what can you do to start uh, to uh, evaluate or help with your evaluation or finding out if you have mast cell issues? This uh, graphic is from the, uh, the Mast Cell Society, and you can find a lot of very good information there. Uh, the first step would be to identify a trigger. And as you can see, stress is a big trigger for the release of mast cells. Also could be medications, certain foods, or strong smells, changes in the temperature, changes in barometric, barometric pressure. And once you identify the trigger, you may be able to avoid or at least decrease exposure. Foods are a big uh, a factor that can cause release of histamine in mast cells. So avoiding foods that are rich in histamine, or sometimes if you have symptoms, worsening of any of your symptoms, 
remember back during that day if you ate some of these foods that are rich in histamine so that could be a, a also a clue that you may have an issue with mast cells well i would recommend if you if you identify some of these symptoms or or changes in your symptoms after these triggers that you discuss with your clinician about completing tests for mast cell activation syndrome uh, this website that the mast cell society has a, a lot of resources, not only for patients, but also for providers. So if your provider is open, you can bring information because it describes what kind of tests can be done and what kind of treatments uh, are helpful, medications and supplements to uh, stabilize these mast cells. And the second uh, big part that also um, affects uh, patients with MECFS that can be important for patients who have post-COVID uh, conditions is uh, autonomic dysfunction. The autonomic system is the part of your nervous system that deals with everything you don't have to think about, everything that's automatic. So you can see here, there's the sympathetic side has functions in many organs in the body, which is the fight or flight response. And the parasympathetic side also has many functions in the body that is associated with the healing and recovery phase. We know that patients with MECFS may have an imbalance between these two sides, and that can cause multiple symptoms. And what we are finding uh, more recently in MECFS is that these issues with autonomic function are associated with a condition called small fiber neuropathy. These small nerves are the ones that control the autonomic functions, and they are finding that there could be some antibodies attacking these nerves. Also, there has been uh, some research studies showing that during exercise, the heart doesn't feel completely, there's an abnormal feeling of blood that will affect how you respond to exercise. And uh, more recently, Dr. Roy Brooklyn Hopkins also published a study where they found that there was decreased amount of blood flow to the brain in patients who have autonomic dysfunction, even if they are not having dizziness or lightheadedness. And that also can affect your fatigue and pain and other symptoms. Some similar studies have been done in patients who have uh, post-COVID conditions, and they are finding also that these patients may have issues with tolerance to exercise and abnormal exercise testing. Um, and also that when they did tilt table tests, they had a uh, reproduction of some of the symptoms they were having with long COVID. They also found they had decreased blood flow to the brain, and they also have been finding a lot of them having issues with a small fiber neuropathy. So what can you do to start the evaluation if you are having some symptoms that can be related to autonomic function dysfunction? One a simple test that you can do, um, that you can ask your clinician to help you with is this one called passive standing test. Basically, um, you have some information here. Dr. Bateman has very good resources on her website about how to, uh, instructions on how to do this test uh, with the clinicians as well. It's a simple test where you will have a patient laying down in the bed for five minutes or so, and then you check the blood pressure, the heart rate, the oxygen levels when they are laying down, and then you ask them to stand up without doing anything, just as still as they can, they lean on the wall for 10 minutes. And then you check the blood pressure and the heart rate throughout the whole 10 minutes, and you keep track of the symptoms they have. They may have dizziness, lightheadedness, and that is a clue that we're having issues with autonomic dysfunction. But one thing that I like to do is document as well uh, the changes that can happen in the color of your skin. This is called acrocyanosis meaning there's the blood pooling that happens in the legs. This is a picture taken right at the beginning of the test, and this is at 10 minutes. As you can see, the changes in the skin kind of gets purple, blotchy, and this means that this blood is staying here and is not going back to circulation, and that affects you know, your blood pressure, your heart rate. So if your clinician is open, that's something that can be done very easily in the clinic. And if they have any evidence of changes there, then that can help you when they refer you to a cardiologist for more formal evaluation with a tilt table test, which would be something similar, but they have more, they monitor your heart rhythm and some other uh, factors when they do the test. And that is helpful to identify if you are suspecting or if you're having issues with getting lightheaded or dizzy when you are changing position from laying down to standing up. Another thing that also is helpful uh, now 
is having an evaluation by the neurologist uh, to have a skin biopsy to diagnose small fiber neuropathy. Uh, this neuropathy won't show up in a regular uh, electromyography and uh, some of the other tests that the neurologists do is usually, and they can say, you know, everything is normal, but the skin biopsy can be helpful because if you find that it's a problem, Dr. Sistrom in his group in Harvard have been doing some research with certain medications, and there are also other uh, studies going on for the use of other interventions, how to help patients who have this condition. So it's important to gather information, and if you can help your provider, you have also here resources with uh, Neuropathy Commons is from a website from Dr. Ann Oaklander, who is doing a lot of research in small fiber neuropathy, has information on how to find clinicians who do these procedures, and also information itself on small fiber neuropathy and how to diagnose. So this, as I mentioned, uh, is a part of the evaluation that can be helpful as well with patients who are having new symptoms after having uh, long COVID. And this is all I have to present for today. Thank you so much uh, for participating. Well, thank you, Dr. Vera, that you covered an awful lot of territory uh, with your presentation, uh, presented a lot of information, and I'm sure generated a lot of questions. But before we get to the q and I think we want to hear from Kylie. Uh, the patient um, and get her perspective to bring balance to this entire presentation. So without further ado, what I would like to do is uh, turn the electronic floor uh, or virtual floor over to Kylie. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Friedman. Um, hello, everyone. I'm very excited to be speaking here today. Um, I know it's it's important to find people that you relate to. So hopefully my speech um, could impact a few in the audience today. Um, but my journey and story probably sounds like those that live and struggle with CFS and dysautonomia. Visits to many doctors and specialists, countless amounts of tests and scans, and no one really knows. No definitive diagnosis, frustration, and some doctors even tell you that it's all in your head. Um, and that all your tests are normal. My struggle began 11 years ago when I was 13, and it wasn't until I saw Dr. Vera at the age of 24 that I can truly say I was diagnosed. I had received parts of my diagnosis throughout my life, early teens, fibromyalgia, my late teens, POTS, um, but it wasn't until this year that I got diagnosed um, with my dysautonomia diagnosis. And Doctors have their best intentions, you know, they have their specialties and learn how to diagnose and treat within their specialties. But a condition like ours, it's not one single cause. It's a cluster of dysfunctions that all add up to struggling every day to the most basic living activities. So cardiologists treat the best they can for things that, you know, are causing problems with your heart, gastro focuses on the gut, but that only treats part of everything we're dealing with. Um, and some may help, but I can say from my experience, the therapies that they provided mask the symptoms. They helped some, but they felt like a Band-Aid. And some drugs even made me feel a little worse. And so this function, this, this is why um, functional medicine and Dr. Vera's approach it, um, at treating chronic fatigue syndrome is really life-changing because she focuses her treatment on getting to the root cause and resolving the issues. Um, and this is why she looks for things like viruses, mold, different toxicities and allergens. Um, and if you take care of the root cause, well, we don't need a Band-Aid. And so don't get me wrong, um, some of the medications improved my symptoms, but what worked is addressing the root cause. And I can speak from my experience that this has been a life-changing approach for me. I don't sleep all the time anymore. I don't feel tired. I've gained my energy and I've even began exercising after a ton of years of not working out. Um, and I couldn't do these things and I haven't been able to do a lot of these things since I was 13 years old. And she's given me my life back and I'm not the only one. I have two acquaintances um, that have been extremely ill with different diseases, different causes, but under the same treatment of Dr. Vera's expertise and the functional medicine approach, 
we all have the same results. Um, all of our lives change, and that's really the only way I can describe it. And this approach gives patients hope, and that's sometimes all we need after you know so many years of of losing it. But yeah, hopefully my story inspired and helped some of you today. And it was um it was a pleasure um, attending this today. Thank you. Well, thank you, Kaylee. I'm sure that what you have said will inspire many, and uh, we're glad that you are recovering. And uh, I hope that um, you will continue to recover. Uh, and I wanna thank you for staying with us um, through this presentation. And you obviously have generated or demonstrated that you have enough energy to do so. So now we will turn to the question and answer portion of today's presentation. If you have a question, uh, please write it in the chat. If you wish to address it to a particular presenter, uh, please do so uh, by typing that information into the chat. Uh, we will cover as many of them as we can. While you do that, I will ask a question that hopefully will be informative to many of them. Uh, this question is for Dr. Vera. And the question is, how do ME-CFS and or long COVID patients who are interested in exploring the functional medicine approach to their care and symptom management identify or find a competent provider and be able to access such care? Thank you for that question. I think it's very important. Um, I am giving the organizers a lot of resources, information on organizations that uh, have lists of providers that can help with those uh, cases. Uh, one of them is the Institute for Functional Medicine, uh, where I train. If you go to their website, there's a section that says find a provider. And in that you can look by your location, but also what kind of expertise these uh, providers have. That is helpful. Uh, also the Osher Collaborative of Integrative Medicine is a group of uh, academic institutions that have clinics who have and use an integrative and whole medicine approach that you can also go to their website and find if there are some of those closer to your area. Uh, the Academy of Integrative Health and Medicine, AIHM, it's also another big organization that trains and have uh, access to many providers that could be not just clinicians, physicians, or, or nurse practitioners, but also uh, all the other uh, integrative medicine modalities that also has on their website a section to find providers that are close in your area. Some of them will have information about the insurances that these uh, providers accept, or if they have access to telemedicine appointments. And one big uh, component that I also found out recently is the, uh, the Department of Veteran Affairs in the United States has a whole, something called a whole health initiative. And there are several clinics that have already implemented, they are implementing, they have clinics for co post COVID cases specifically, but also have this uh, integrative modality where they will cover evaluation with chiropractors, acupuncturists and uh, nutritionists, uh, but it, it, it varies by location. So you can also go to that website for the, a VA whole health initiative that also will be part of the resources. More specifically for uh, mast cell activation and dysautonomia, which are two big areas that are so overlap uh, in, in this uh, MECFS and post COVID conditions. Uh, the mast cell disease society, the, you had some information from the graphics I, I put in the presentation, but you will also have a link in the resources. They also have been very actively educating providers and they have a lot of information for resources and providers that are listed there also have experience evaluating these conditions. And lastly, for autonomic dysfunction, there uh, is this Autonomia International is a big uh, advocate organization that has offers a lot of resources for patients with list providers as well. And the American Autonomic Society also has a link for providers who are trained specifically for autonomic dysfunction. 
Okay, thank you for that. Uh, there are multiple questions here on how people can get in touch with you, Dr. Vera. So I'm not sure how you wish to handle that question. Uh, the easiest way is uh, if they can go to the, uh, my current clinic is the whole psychiatry uh, center. And if you go to the website, there is a section for new patients who want more information. You can complete your information and then our staff will get back to you. I think that's the easiest way. Okay. Um, one thing that I can think of, but I have to clear it with the powers that be, in the email that goes out to um, participants of this meeting, um, announcing that the recording is available, perhaps we could also include contact information. So if the powers that be are willing to do that, we can, we can also include that as well. Another popular question seems to be about medications and MECFS. So I'm wondering if you can comment upon those medications that you feel are most effective for which symptoms in MECFS? Well, that's a complex question. Um, as I said, you know, my experience has been when I started my journey, I started seeing patients with MECFS. I was very focused on immune dysfunction and using antivirals. And I found that they could be very helpful for a group of people, but doesn't work on everybody. So now what I do is I start first, I think it's important to gather information and see what systems are affected and see if there's a common cause. So for example, uh, some cases I have uh, had patients who had exposure to mold at some point in their lives, maybe not now, but they have issues with autonomic dysfunction, muscle activation, immune issues. And if we are able to identify that and we can help them you know, remove that exposure, then you can work on all the other aspects as well. So it depends. It is not, unfortunately, as I said, it's not, I would love to have a recipe. And actually that's part of some of the research initiatives that are happening right now to try to see if we can find common groups uh, in between the diagnosis of MECFS that they respond specifically, if we can predict who can respond to a specific intervention. So what I would say is first, you need to gather information. And the second part, what I do as well, and also some of my colleagues that have this uh, experience with uh, whole health approaches, is that I also try to prioritize. Because even though if we have, let's say an example, uh, Epstein-Barr virus activation that is very active, sometimes I cannot start with the antiviral from the beginning because the patient is so inflamed that if I try to use the an antiviral and I have done <laughs> at the beginning, they will crash because there's so much inflammation happening. So then sometimes it's just, I need to start, usually it's work on the nutrients because I see a lot of deficiencies and sometimes we don't expect for that, but being able to replace nutrients, work on, on your gut health as well, making sure that the, the, the symptoms are stable, there's no inflammation, you're absorbing those nutrients uh, because if the gut is inflamed, even if you take medications, you may not have the benefit because you're they're actually not absorbing as well and also managing stress. That also has been another big factor as well. So when we discuss uh, in my presentation, ideally is you work on the prioritize what could have the most impact and could be you know, something that your patient can tolerate. And then you work your way up until you get, you eventually get to the viruses and you get, eventually get to other factors, but it depends on the patient. And that's the difficult part, I think, because it would be helpful to have and tell you, this is my recipe. I don't have one. I go, you know, depending on what I find on the testing and the story from the patient, I identify the what can we work on and then just do it step by step. Okay, so there are now more questions concerning your practice. Um, are you open to new patients? Do you know how patients outside of the United States uh, can access your care? Um, and do you see patients for illnesses other than MECFS and long COVID? Um, it will depend on the ability the patients that they have to come to an in-person visit in Maryland because that is the requirement. If they are able to come for an initial visit and have you know, the evaluation and the testing, 
I can do telemedicine for certain states and for certain uh, countries as well. I do speak Spanish, so I also can see patients who are Spanish speakers. And as I mentioned, um, and my main focus has been is in immune dysfunction and dysautonomia, uh, my expertise as well. So I focus mostly on those two areas. The resources I, I'm providing uh, also, especially for the Institute for Functional Medicine, there's a lot of more providers uh, training abroad as well. So the patients will have access to some of those, hopefully locally, uh, providers locally that can uh, be able to help. Are there lists of overseas providers um, yes. available? Yeah. Yeah, in many of the institutions I'm mentioning, uh, there's uh, national, but also international providers. Okay. Uh, there's a question about gut inflammation. Is there a test for gut inflammation or how do you determine that there is gut inflammation? It will um, depend on how much, uh, yes, there are some tests that we can do. I would start first with symptoms, um, especially if uh, patients have issues with uh, nausea or reflux or pain in the abdomen, especially after eating or diarrhea, constipation. And there are some studies that you can do in specialty labs that can measure um, the amount of balance of the good bacteria, the bad kind of bacteria if there is overgrowth or if there's a absorption. There are some blood tests as well that you can do to evaluate um, the permeability of the lining in the, in the intestine, like sonulin, for example, that is also available. Most of them are uh, as part of the specialty labs. Okay. And there is uh, interest in managing sleep. So beside trying to improve your sleep hygiene, what would be the functional medicine approach toward improving sleep for ME-CFS or long COVID patients? The idea would be to evaluate some tests. For example, uh, hormone testing can help, cortisol imbalance, especially if you have a high cortisol going into bedtime, can point you and there are some supplements and some um, medications you can use to help with that. Uh, also, there are certain nutrients, for example, magnesium is a simple one I mentioned before. Uh, ideally, you first measure to make sure because it can be uh, a problem if it's uh, too high, but magnesium uh, before going to bed is also another option. There are different kinds of magnesiums um, that have different kinds of absorption. So magnesium threonate, for example, is one that can be helpful, doesn't cause diarrhea, but can help with sleep as uh, cysteine is also another one. Uh, there are other nutrients as well uh, that help with balance of stress like uh, or herbs like ashwagandha, um, phosphatidylserine uh, that can help to balance. But ideally would be if cortisol is a concern, then ideally would be to have a measurement to know because some patients may have symptoms that could go either with high or low levels. And if you use the incorrect supplement or medication, that can cause problems. Okay, one area we haven't covered is payment. So um, what insurances um, will cover um, the cost of your care or how do patients manage to get you paid? Uh, at this moment, uh, in my practice, is a cash based practice, uh, so there's uh, no coverage with insurances. But as I mentioned, the Institute for Functional Medicine and some of these other uh, have at least when you look for providers that they will include. Uh, there are there are some clinicians that accept insurances, especially if it's an academic institution, for example, like. Um, the ones I mentioned in the OSHER collaborative, a lot of those bigger institutions have uh, con con contracts with insurances so they can uh, get some of the tests done through insurances and most of the appointments and follow-ups and even health coaches um, as well that can be covered. So there are some options and I understand and that you know it's a little challenging from the clinician perspective because reimbursement with some of these uh, evaluations um, it's not ideal, so that's why most, uh, a lot of the, uh, providers who work in integrative medicine field opt 
for a cash pay model, but there are also uh, now more awareness and more institutions that are uh, using that approach as well. So it will be a matter of investigating what is available closer in your area because there are some that will take insurance and you can start at least you know, with basic evaluations and interventions. Yeah, I think that as long COVID becomes more of a problem, um, there will be easier payment for that. And then hopefully groups such as uh, Mass MECFS, FM Association and NJ MECFSA can advocate for inclusion of uh, MECFS as well. And as you have indicated, and I would encourage you as well as other clinicians to try and attempt to document that the symptoms are very similar and the uh, treatment of those symptoms are very similar uh, so that we can assure that uh, both diseases move forward together um, and not one be distinguished from the other in terms of the kinds of care or treatment that is uh, available um, to them. There is a question of concern um, that um, some physicians may say that they uh, subscribe to the biopsychosocial philosophy of MECFS treatment, but are really not holistic or functional medicine in their approach uh, to MECFS. And so there is a concern of uh, one or more patients in our audience that wants to know how they can be assured that they will be getting the kind of care that you are describing. It depends on... Um... Definitely that's where it comes, the empowering and advocating for yourself. Ideally, we'll, you will have different access, but the whole idea is that you look for somebody who is not just focusing in one thing. Like just thinking, you know, this is the one diagnosis and the one treatment, but it's also exploring other diagnoses. Sometimes, you know, I had to train a lot to be able to understand, and I still a lot that I need to learn. Uh, in, there's new research coming up to evaluate and treat certain conditions. So not everybody has the time to keep up to date or keep training all these factors. But the idea would be uh, finding somebody or discussing with your doctor, just thinking, okay, I have this diagnosis, but what else are we looking into? What else are we addressing? What else? or if you have other symptoms in other organs, is it related to that diagnosis? That Does that diagnosis explain all the symptoms you have or the treatment that you are doing for that is helping with all the symptoms you have? It is not, then discuss with your doctor or sometimes, you know, they will know, they may refer you to a nutritionist or another uh, health uh, worker that can help you uh, deal with some specific aspect. So that's the whole idea. And, you know, in an ideal world, we will have all these care teams where you have all these providers involved. Some of these institutions, especially the academic ones, are working on having that approach and have access to these therapies and uh, these other healthcare members. But it's mainly on if you feel that what they are, the treatment that you're receiving is addressing all your concerns. If it's not, ask your doctor, or if not, ask if he can refer you to somebody else who may know a little more about that. Sometimes you may have you may have your primary care as the coordinator, and then you will have different specialists. Not everybody, some of these uh, specialists that deal with autonomic dysfunction, they may not know about other areas, but if they can help you with that aspect and you come back to your main clinician and coordinate the care with other doctors, that's also another uh, alternative. Okay, I think we're about out of time. I think we have covered most of the questions um, that, that have been asked. So I want to thank Dr. Vera and Kaylee for their presentations. Uh, the I want to remind you that the recording session will be posted on the Mass MECFS YouTube channel within a few days, and we will send an email out about that. Um, for July, Sunday Conversations is going to take a vacation, but we are planning a special program in August, and we will send out more information to all registrants about that upcoming event, which will be on August 21st of this year. 
If you have any ideas for future programs or speakers uh, for this series, please email events at massmecfs.org. Again, for suggestions for future programs or speakers, please email events at mecfs.org. Sunday Conversations is not intended to be a series of research presentations, but rather this series is to provide a variety of practical information for patients and families, which we believe and hopefully you will tell us you want. So if you would like some input and would like to participate in being a team member of Sunday Conversations, please email to a different address. If you want to be part of the Sunday Conversations team, please email volunteer at, me, at massmecfs.org. Again, if you wish to volunteer, please send an email to volunteer at massmecfs.org. We are working on the fall schedule now, so if you wish to have input, please let us know. Finally, if you have found this program useful, worthwhile, you can help us by making a donation online to either organization, MassME or NJME CFS Association. Both organizations have ways of making online donations. If you feel you can help in some other way, uh, you might consider becoming a member of either organization, or you can volunteer your time. If you don't have a particular job in mind or particular topic with which you wish to help, but just have the ability to volunteer in general, contact the organization of your choice, and I'm sure that we will be able to identify a task that you can do to assist the organizations in their work. And so with that, I would like to thank all the participants, uh, and I would like to thank all of the all of the audience who has tuned in. Remember, we hope to see you on August 21st. And with that, I want to wish you good health, stay safe, try and get a little enjoyment in your life because that lifts your spirits. I know it is a difficult time during a pandemic, but hopefully we will all see you again on the 21st. Thank you very much.